Okay, Sunday school this week. Uh, this week we're in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, got some interesting verses to go over today. We're going to be looking at the first 14 verses of the 24th chapter. This is better known, uh, these verses along with the, um, the rest of this chapter and the uh, chapter 25 is better known as the Olivet Discourse. But Jesus is leaving the temple and he's staying in Bethany as we've talked about. And um, so from Jerusalem to Bethany, you travel along and up and over the Mount of Olives. And so this is where we'll also find Jesus visiting with the disciples. There, When you're on top, of, I, I've not been there, but just the description of it, it's, it's a magnificent view from on top of the Mount of Olives looking back at Jerusalem. It would have been then looking back at the at the temple. Um, it's, it's a distance away across the Kidron Valley, but uh, it would be quite a view, especially if you think about it, this was probably late in the day and the sun setting and looking back, but uh, it would have been a magnificent view, a nice place to sit and reflect. And so Jesus is talking to them about the end times. And we pick up in the first two verses and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the temple, the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So he comes out of the temple, and the first thing the disciples do is they stop him and they, they want to show him all the magnificent buildings of the temple, not just the temple itself, but the buildings around. They, they come out and they say, look at this. You know, these, these are really, really marvelous buildings. And <clears throat> it's also known as Herod's temple uh, because Herod oversaw the rebuilding of the temple. Um, started a few years before Jesus' birth and actual, all the work on the buildings around, <clears throat> what I read, continued on up until about 63 A.D., uh, before they finished with all the various buildings. But the temple was was built in Jesus' time. and But Jesus had just been in the temple and had been discussing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and uh, had been a bit stirred up uh, because of what was going on there in his house. And it says here in our text that the temple served a distinguished purpose in God's plan to reveal himself to mankind. You know, the temple was was where the presence of God was at. And but with it says here, but with the time by the time Jesus arrived to earth it had become symbolic of religious hypocrisy and legalism, even as Jesus himself became the fulfillment of everything to which the Mosaic law pointed. At this point the temple would no longer be necessary since Jesus had come. It seems the disciples saw the temple as a source of honor and national pride. That's why they stopped him on the way out. They said, look at, look at this. Look at what we've got. You know, they were just proud, which can be okay. They were proud of, of the temple and what they had. And there's nothing wrong with being pleased and, and having a nice place of worship um, that as long as it's being used for that, as long as it's being used to further... God's king, kingdom and, and furthering the gospel, the spread of the gospel. The problem here was it said it becomes symbolic of religious hypocrisy and legalism. That's what it had, had devolved into. That's what it had become. And the temple was no longer needed because Jesus was here. God in the flesh was with us. He was here on earth. Now when he talks about He says, you're looking at these things, and this, this whole place is going to be destroyed. There's not going to be one stone on top of another. Some people think that Jesus is talking about that nothing that's man-made will last forever. I mean, anything that man builds will be destroyed at some point. Nothing will last forever. But a lot of people believe, and I believe, that he was talking about the actual destruction of the temple. In 70 A.D., the temple was destroyed. It was destroyed to the point that today archaeologists 
have no idea where the sanctuary actually was. It was so completely destroyed because Jesus said any stone stacked on top of another is going to be torn apart, going to be taken down. And then you stop and you wonder, well, <clears throat> that's, that's pretty serious. I mean, just totally dismantling. But when you stop and you look at what occurred, what happened, and how Jesus knew the events that would be coming and how God can use people even unwillingly and unknowingly for his plan because the way it was destroyed people put a value on something there I've got in, and that's one of the things that this, there's things in this world on this earth this broken world that we put value in that's just because we think it's valuable we put value in it because it means something to us maybe but I've, I've got a coin here that is a 1899S $5 gold piece. And I remember my grandmother showing me this when I was however long ago I can remember. I was less than 10 years old. And she, she showed me this coin one day. It actually belonged to her father, my great-grandfather. And it's, it's rated very fine condition. You can read everything on it with just your, you know, maybe a pair of glasses on, but but you can see all the fine detail on this coin. And it means a lot to me. It has a lot of value to me because of who it belonged to. And that it was my great-grandfather's, and it was my grandmother's, and now it's mine. And I collect coins, and I collect stamps. Haven't acquired any in a long time, but in all the coins I have, this is the one that means the most to me. It is the most valuable to me. But in all reality, the, the value the world puts on this coin is simply in the quarter ounce of gold that it contains. If you wanted to sell this, this, the value of this coin on the open market is dictated solely because it's a quarter ounce of gold. And whatever the price of gold is, divide it by four and that's what this coin is worth. So when the general of the General Titus of the Roman army when they came into Jerusalem in 70 AD he was going to leave the temple he saw this building for what it was and magnificent and he wasn't going to do anything about it but some of the other soldiers burned it and if you study what was in the temple you'll know that there, the temple was filled with gold objects it was filled with religious objects that were made of gold and in this fire they melted the gold melted. Gold has a very low melting point and the, all the gold items melted and they seeped down into the cracks and the crevices of all the stones. And so at this point, the Roman army, he, Titus told them to recover because he knew that it was valuable, all that gold, and he told them to recover all that. And so they dismantled the entire temple to, to gather up all the gold because that's all the value that they saw in it was the gold that was melted and seeped down into the cracks. There was no value in the fact that this was God's house. There was no value in the fact that this sanctuary is over here and it's not worth what it costs this church to build it. It's worth what we can do with it, spreading the gospel. And so that's why Jesus is, is telling them here and what we, our author of the text wants us to get out of this we need to understand that worldly treasures can be great gifts for kingdom advancement but the moment they become the targets of our devotion we have become guilty of idolatry the things we have are great and good if we're using them for the furtherance of God's kingdom but as soon as we start being more concerned about them, those objects and, and, and thinking that they're more important and we don't want to let anything get in front of this. We don't want to let anything get ahead of this. That's when it becomes idolatry, and that's when that's when it's not right. And that's what Jesus was sharing with them here. It says, while church buildings might be a great tools for the body in advancing God's kingdom, temporary assets are not required for obedience to God. God can empower churches to take the gospel to the nations with or without worldly treasures. We just need to keep that in mind. 
in all that we have. We're to use it for God's work. And we're to use it according to God's will. But we just don't need to let ourselves and the world get in the way of that. And then we move on to verses 3 through 8. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, by the end, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse, in diverse places. And these are the beginning of the sorrows. So in the third verse there, he says, he was sitting on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately. There was four of them came to him and started asking him some questions. And they wanted to know, they say, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of that coming? And it says, and of the end of the world. The word that was translated to come up with world, uh, maybe a better use of that or another use of that would be to say age or era. They're not typic not necessarily asking Jesus when's the end of the world coming, but when is this age, the end of this age coming? When is the end of this era coming? And what we look at here what we get out of this is, when is the end of the church age? When will that be coming? That's what Jesus is talking to him about here. When is the end of the church age? Because the Jewish people, he knows that the Jews are about to, you know, they're about to crucify him. He's just three days away from being crucified. He's only six weeks away from being taken up into heaven from exactly where he's standing right now, or where he's sitting right now, from the Mount of Olives. You know, so he's got just a very short time here on earth. And, uh, you know, he's got some things to share with the disciples. They've got some questions, and they need to be shared so that we can have them here today to look at. And so he's talking to them about the end of the church age. And the end of the church age is when Jesus will return. And he says, and Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So he's telling us that, okay, we're going to need to be careful because there will be people deceiving. And then he says, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be wars going on, but don't be troubled for all these things. They've got to happen. before, And, and it's still not the end. And then nations going to, you know, Countries are going to fight against each other. Kingdoms are going to fight against each other. There's going to be famines. There's going to be all kinds of bad things. There's going to be famines and pestilence and earthquakes. The thing is we have a lot of these all through the church age as well. There's a lot of wars. There have been wars. There will continue to be wars. There's earthquakes. There's famines. There's pestilence. All of these things will happen, but then he says... Then all of these are the beginning of sorrows. So these are moving along and then things are going to get worse. But you remember back last year we studied Revelation. And you read through this and you, you see this and you get, you know, it'll make a person worry when there's nothing to worry about because we know how it ends. But it'll make a person concerned and a person wow, I just, I really don't want to, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to have to live through that. I don't want to know that, I know it's coming, but, you know, we've got something that we have to face up to at some point in our life, and we just, that we dread. The thing is, we don't have to dread this. We don't have to dread what he's talking about, the tribulation period, because the way I believe the way I see it and the way I think y'all see it is he's talking about the end of the church age. He's talking about when Jesus comes again. Jesus is going to come again and he's going to take all of us, his people, with him. 
we will be raptured out of here. We won't be here for the great tribulation. We won't be here for the Antichrist and all of his dirty deeds. We won't be here to live through all that. He's talking to these disciples because he's talking and describing a lot of these things that God's chosen people, the Jewish people, will have to live through. They're going to have to go through this because they didn't accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. The end of the church age is the end of, of Christians. This, the end of the church age will be the end of those that have accepted Jesus Christ and what he did dying on the cross for us. Jesus will come. Excuse me, will come. He will take us out of here. And at that point, you can well imagine that that's going to get a lot of folks' attention. And, but it does not mean during the tribulation period that people won't be saved. People will be saved. There will be 144,000 Jewish people spreading the gospel throughout the world that will be sharing because they've come to the realization that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and they missed it the first time around. But he's come back. And saying that Jesus, talking about Jesus' second coming, we don't need to get confused and think that he's going to come, he's going to get us. That'll be the rapture. And then people get messed up because they think, well, we're talking about the second coming and he's going to come and rapture everybody out. And then we're going to have seven years of tribulation. And then he's going to come again. And so now you're telling me that there's going to be three times that Jesus comes? We don't need to get caught up and confused in that. The second coming is a period of time. Jesus' first, when Jesus first came here, we don't look at Jesus' birth and call that the first coming of Christ. And that was that, and that was the end of it. No, we look at Jesus' time here on earth. The first coming of Christ was his time here on earth from his birth until his ascension into heaven from the Mount of Olives. As I said, six weeks after this conversation he's having. It was the 33 years that he was here on earth. That was the first coming. So the second coming is not one day and one event. It's the period of time that encompasses from the rapture until the end, when the, he when the heavens and the earth will be destroyed and, and rebuilt. That's the second coming. So we don't have dread to look forward to. We don't have to worry about all these terrible things that have been talking about and all the suffering and such because we won't be here for it and we'd rather not anybody else have to go through that we would rather everybody that we come in contact with be with us the great thing would be if the tribulation was just Satan and his minions hanging out here for seven years and them suffering through it but unfortunately that's not the way it's going to be there will be folks here that have to deal with that. It says in our text here, whether it be a pandemic, an election, a war, a natural disaster, or anything else that brings people to their knees, children of God must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. We have the only good news that has the ability to save mankind. May we never take our eyes off of Him. We need to share that with everybody around us. We don't need to get, you know, we're, we're suffering through a pandemic right now. And it's, it's like a roller coaster. It's up and down. It's, it's, there's another surge going right now. And this one too will come to an end. And, and we'll move forward from that. But we don't ever want to take our eyes off of Jesus Christ. We don't ever want to stop and say, well, it's just not worth it. I, 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 I can't believe God would allow this. And so people turn away from God because they don't understand that this is a broken world. It's not God's fault that anything's happening. It's our own fault that all these things happen. But Jesus Christ offers us a way out. Offers to and he did pay the price for each and every one of us. So then we move to 9 through 13. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and shall be 
and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So this is the start of the tribulation period that he's talking to them about. He's talking to them about the end of the age. The church age has ended and now they move into the first half of the tribulation period. So we can we can see, we can imagine that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to accept Jesus Christ for it because they're going to be so well, we can't imagine what it would be like, but when you see somebody right here beside you one instant and then the next instant they're gone, you're going to wonder what's going on. You're going to want to learn a little bit. You're going to want to realize that, well, they've been talking to me about something. They've talked to me about Jesus. Maybe I better look into this a little more. Maybe, and So there will be people that will be saved. But then what they're going to have to deal with is it says you'll, they're going to kill you. You're going to be hated of all nations. There's going to be pe- nations that turn against Christianity. There's going to be people that turn against Christians. It doesn't tell us exactly why or how things are going to be done other than it's Satan trying to do his thing. But all these people are taken out of here and I don't know. I, I guess maybe some folks are blaming God for bringing what raining this terror down on the earth, and all these people are taken away that aren't going to have to deal with it. Well, that's just not fair. That's not fair for it to happen to me and not to happen to them. I'm a good person too. I'm not any worse than they are. That's just not fair. Well, that's what human nature is like. We always want to put a value on things, and we always want to gauge things and and have a balance out there and make sure things are equitable. We, we want things to be fair in our mind. There's nothing fair about anything that mankind has done against God. There's nothing fair about Jesus Christ dying on the cross, a sinless man, God in the flesh. There's nothing fair about Him dying on the cross for, for me. There's nothing fair about that. But He did. And so these people are going to be upset. And then there's going to be folks that profess Jesus Christ as their Savior at this time because they're going to understand and they're going to accept what He did. And there's going to be folks that get mad and get aggravated about that. And they just, they're going to want to kill you. We see it right now. There's areas of this world that Christians have to fear for their life if it's made known that they're a Christian. There's, there's areas in this world today where they demand that you renounce Christ as your Savior or they'll kill you. And it says, And many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Another. There's going to be people turning their friends and their neighbors and their family because they're going to be out looking for Christians looking to weed these people out. They brought all this down on us and we want retribution. We want payback. And so there's going to be people that are going to turn on others. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Meaning, because of what's going on, there's even going to be people that profess to be saved. But then when it comes right down to it, they're, they're going to give up. They're going to renounce Christ. There's going to be people that when it comes down to you either renounce Christ or we're going to, we're going to take your life. They see more value in the waning few moments of their life here on this earth instead of looking at eternity and thinking of nothing but themselves instead of Jesus Christ and furthering God's kingdom and they're going to say well yeah I, I, I really don't they're, the love of many shall wax cold 
So that's what he's telling us here. There's people that are going to renounce Jesus Christ. They never were saved to start with. If you can't face death and know that the next step is going to be you will be in the presence of your Savior. You'll be in the presence of the Lord. We've seen it in our lifetime. And crazy things that have happened here on, in this country where people have threatened people, others with their life. Renounce Jesus Christ or I'm going to kill you. And, and they refuse to do it. And they lose their life. They lose their life here and now. Their eternal life is in God's presence. So there's going to be people that, that deal with that. They're going to go through with that. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. He's telling the disciples that those people that accept Jesus Christ and endure to the end of the tribulation or endure until the end of their life, they will be saved. They will be taken out of here. They will be in heaven in the presence of their Savior. And then in chapter 24, verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So everybody on the earth is going to have the privilege of hearing the gospel, is going to have the privilege of hearing that Jesus Christ died for them. Everyone on the earth will hear the gospel. And then the end shall come. So that's telling us that we have a job to do. We all know that we're here for God's will. If we're saved, if we're a Christian. We know we're here to do God's work. And what's God's work? God's work is to go and share with everybody around. Everybody in the world. That might mean your next door neighbor. That might mean somebody living halfway across the world, around the world. It, we don't know who it is. We pray that the Lord will lead us in the direction. He has a work for each and every one of us. He has somebody. He has multiple somebodies for each of us to reach. Sometimes it's just reaching somebody and we had no idea that we did. Sometimes it's just simply following God's will and living the life of a Christian and somebody else seeing that. And they may not ask you about it, but they may ask somebody that they know a little better. They may, and it just, when the Holy Spirit is moving them, they'll start, so we don't know exactly what our call is we don't know exactly what our work is but we know that Jesus is not coming back until everyone has the opportunity to hear now some some say and it tells us in Revelation we we studied that just prior to Jesus' returning there will be an angel that will herald the good news all around the world we just may look at that as, you know, picking up the pieces. That doesn't mean for us to sit on our hands and just wait and watch for that angel to come and herald throughout the world. We have a responsibility to do what we can to share. And the angel will come and herald just for good measure, you might say. Just getting to that last one final person but we don't need to take this and to think that well you know it says that the angels are going to come and they're going to go fly around the world and they're going to tell everybody and we'll just we'll just let that be good enough that that's not how it works too often that's the easy way out for us i mean we run across that at work Everybody does, I'm sure. But just yesterday, I had someone come to me and say, hey, I'm trying to sell this truck. Can't find the key. 
It's parked over here where we park them when they first come in and they do the pre-delivery inspection. But I also noticed that uh, there's this program we pull up and we look to see if there's been any service bulletins or any recalls on the vehicle. You always have to check this because there can be reprogrammings and things that have to be done to a vehicle before, before you, you sell it to the final person. This particular vehicle needed to have its window sticker replaced because of the great Monroney Act, they call it, but it dictates what's on the window sticker and there was a little minor change that had to be made to the window sticker. And so that's how important it is. The, the incorrect window sticker does not need to be on the vehicle when it's delivered. So it, the person that did the inspection of the vehicle when it came in that's part of their job, they see that. They knew that it had had this need of this service bulletin being done, this sticker replaced. The advisor that wrote the ticket up knew it as well. The truck had been sitting there for several days. So the salesman goes and asks them about it and they said, well, we're waiting for the window sticker to show up. You need to ask so-and-so about it. Well, so-and-so's not at work. So you need to ask the parks department about it. They say, well, we don't know where they're at. We don't know where they come through. Well, it's just all it was amounts to is people had a job to do and rather than get up and go ask to go find this, they just figure if I wait long enough, somebody else will take care of it. And other somebody's do. And so I simply, and I'm not saying it, but in this particular instance, that other somebody was me. I go to another individual's office and where I know that window stickers come in and are deposited and it, would, it took me all of about five minutes to find it. You open it up and there it is and you take it back to the service and here it is and by the way here's another one that y'all need to do that was in there with this. But it just, you know, it's, we get aggravated and, and it gets discouraging to us when we see people not wanting to complete their job, to complete their task, to follow through. And they feel like, you know, we feel like they were just waiting for somebody else to do it. Y'all ever work side by side with someone and watch them kind of back off a little bit and you feel like you're having to pull them on and they're just letting you go on because they know the more you do, the less they'll have to do. You pick the task, you pick the job, and we've all experienced that. We've all seen that. And so the next thing you know, everybody starts kind of backing off. You know, that's because everybody feels like they're going to have the same reward at the end. There's no need for me to put in extra effort. I'll just let somebody else do it for me. Well, do you want to have to face Jesus Christ and say, you know, I really didn't feel like going and doing that that time and sharing my testimony and sharing the gospel with that group of people over there because I knew that you were going to take care of it in the end. I knew that you were going to send an angel to talk to them in the end. I knew that everybody would hear in the end. I just didn't really feel like putting out that extra effort. That's what we need to be sure we don't get caught up in. That's what we want to be sure that you know, don't we all want to hear, well done, my good and faithful child? I want that angel to show up and be heralding around, the, going around the world and sharing the gospel and they say, oh yeah, 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 we, we've already heard that. We already know. We've already heard about it. Rather than for that to be the first time they heard it. It says in our text, we exist to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom to the far reaches of the globe. When our king returns, may he find us faithfully obedient to his great commission. That's a pretty important statement right there that they shared with us. That we need to know that we follow that. And then we simply need to testify to the goodness of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all we have to do. Testify to the goodness of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
and we can we can do that each and every day each and every day with each and every person that's placed before us because people are watching you start going out and letting people know that you're a Christian they're going to watch okay I've heard about them it's not a one time meeting it's not a one time conversation it's a lifelong way of living it's a continual everyday thing we don't meet and worship once a week we have conversations with God continually. We can worship God in our own way continually throughout the week, each and every day. And we can do that by letting people see it in us each day. Letting people see a little bit of light, a little bit of God reflecting in everything that we do so that they can start asking, whether it be us or someone else, but so they too won't have to suffer through this tribulation period. We exist to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom to the far reaches of the globe. When our king returns, may he find us faithfully obedient to his great commission. With that, I'd like for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning so thankful that you give us a work to do. So thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, for dying on the cross for each and every one of us so thankful Lord that you entrust into us that you wish for us to, to go out throughout the world proclaiming this good news that you thought so much of us not only for Jesus to die on the cross for each of us but you thought that we were worthy enough to share this with the entire world I just pray Lord that we will look and seek and take advantage of every opportunity that you put before us. That we will spend our life reaching out to those around us, reaching out, testifying for Jesus Christ and what he did for each and every one of us. I pray, Lord, that you'd continue to bless this service this morning, bless the choir, the music being lifted in your up to your honor and glory the, the words on Brother Donis's heart Lord that, that you've thought to share with us today I just ask that you be with each of the prayer requests mentioned this morning and those unspoken as well to give us wisdom and understanding as to your will in each of these I ask forgiveness where I fail you in your son Jesus' name we pray Amen